takes like a, a couple of seconds to get it going. Here we go. Right, copy. And that link should be with you now. I'll send it to myself so I can get it out yeah. to social media. <coughs> Have you seen the explosion in Lebanon? Sorry? Have you seen the explosion in Lebanon? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. Crazy, That's isn't it? Yeah, pretty impressive. Right. Okay, it's working. Six watching now. And yeah, let so. me share it as well. So give me like a couple of minutes here at it. Like I'm just going to get that link out to our social media sites. Uh, again, guys, get your questions in. We're here with Ate. He's a former Rafael, uh, Super Attendard and Rafael pilot. So plenty to talk about. And he's uh, becoming a, a social media star, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> So bear with me, guys, while I get this out. Uh, I'll be with you in two seconds. Da, da, da. But Atta, yeah, what's what's been happening since the last time we talked? It's been about, uh, oh, when did we last chat? It was probably like a month and a half, two months ago, something like that. So the good thing is <laughs> we weren't locked down, so that's great. But uh, yeah. I've, been in France. Um, I've been around in France. I've been invited to... Um, I can tell you the exact airport, but I spent three days uh, integrated, embedded with ATC from a major airport in France. So that's going to be some cool footage coming up. Oh, wow. Um, pretty intense stuff. That was pretty nice. So now I understand air traffic controllers even better, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> Same world. <laughs> going to try to share that later on. But uh and other than that, I've been very busy with, you know what it's like, with a YouTube channel, uh, growing another one, uh, yeah. more on esports, aviation esports, stuff like that. And and that's it. Some workout and watching your interviews, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you told me you're moving to Germany. What, what's what's all that about, Ate? Oh, uh, we, we like to move a lot. Uh, we spent 18 months in, in England, in the UK. That's where I started my business. Um, we were west of um, London, uh, near Basingstock, and after a first experience in the UK, we came back to France for a year, and now that our kids speak um, Her Majesty English with a, the British accent, unlike me, uh, we're trying to get them on the other side of the force, the German side, and uh, we're moving to Nuremberg for a year. To, to get them to, to speak um, German. So we're gonna sh uh, send our kids to, to German school. And usually around those age or below 10, in a year it's enough to be pretty fluent. So that's why we're moving to Germany. And for me, between internet and, and crossing the Atlantic to work in Canada, as long as I'm close to an airport, I can commute. So, so, so that's the next move for the family. So it should be pretty fun. We're moving in moving in 18 days so it's going to be wow. nice so a, a lot to take in at the moment <laughs> yes but, uh, and actually i'm starting to look at um, museums in germany um because there are lots of outstanding museums in the uk i think it's a good opportunity to try to learn more from the german side of world war ii and all that stuff so i'll try to find some niche museums and and some some pretty cool stuff to to enhance my my awareness of World War II German technology, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you, like, why the questions come in. Get the uh, get the questions coming in, guys. I know, like, it's early days, but uh, yeah, do you do you plan to get out with like a camera, or do you pl still plan to do, uh, you know, like Skype interviews? What's your uh, progress on the channel? Yeah, it's going to depend. Like, so uh, right now I've got two. So brand new two channels. One channel, uh, Debrief. Uh, I post in English and French. Um, movie reviews where I share around aviation and um, very specific and very specific subjects around aviation. So right now I mostly did it in French because I mostly have a French audience, but I'm going to be doing them in English as well. And I've been studying aviation mishaps, stuff like that. 
Um, so those one, I don't really need to go outside to shoot. Uh, but I started a, a small vlog. I think the vlog format could be fun as well, a vlog that shows around the aviation as I move from places to places. So I think that's going to keep coming. And on the other channel, it's more around flight simulation. Uh, you know, for the new flight sim is coming out. Uh, DCS has a nice community, and it's pretty cool. Uh, you can do a lot of good stuff. So I think it's going to be a mix of moving around with a camera and staying home and just sharing footage. And it's going to depend on the, on the COVID crisis as well, because I won't course, be traveling yeah. more if I'm stuck in Germany. So, so it's hard <laughs> to tell. I had a, somebody posted a comment today saying, oh, it's great, I'm watching your, um, your videos because I'm stuck at home in Melbourne because we just did a new lockdown. So I'm like, okay, we'll see how it goes. But uh, so let's stay flexible. Yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, you've done some like um, I've, I've been watching your recent videos and they're absolutely incredible. But like you're quite prolific in terms of like the content you put out. It's almost like it's daily. It's you know they come out yeah you know and I'm like wow, <laughs> this guy yeah. is like doing something great. Uh, I'm gonna reduce this, the rate a little bit. I, you know the deal with internet, you have to produce initially to get to understand the algorithm and get to understand your audience. Yeah. So I really do a lot of testing on. At what time I should release, how the algorithm works. It's really sad in a way because when you put out content, you, YouTube is going to boost it on day one. And then on day two, it's like yeah. massive down. So yeah, if you totally. want to move fast, it's all about you have to post daily. There's, there's, there is no other way around it. Yeah. So I wanted to, to bring my channel to a given level before being able to dump the boosters, <laughs> just like SpaceX, and then get into um, a cruise altitude. So um, because I had some time, um, I really wanted to do it this summer. And I, I, the more I do it, the more I enjoy it. So, but I'm going to have to reduce the content now. So I think I'll go to two or three videos a week. But then because I post in two languages, it makes a bit more. But uh, one movie review and one very serious video a week, and then maybe if need be, some reaction to news uh, should be manageable with my schedule i think that's what i'm heading toward too plus some gaming stuff or esports stuff on the side but something different and honestly it's easier to produce esport content than those niche videos because esport content is i play i explain and it's all ready <laughs> but when wow. you have to put jokes in and everything it's you know what it's like it takes yeah time. yeah of course well, Ate, you're putting to me to shame like uh, a couple of videos a week and that's uh, what you're doing, but it's great. But uh, as you've seen, there's some co uh, uh, questions coming in there. So I'm going to let you loose, but I'm going to continue to push this out on social media. So if you want to answer them, uh, that'll be great, Ate. Cheers. Sure. Thanks. Uh, welcome, everyone. So right now, I'm not at my regular place. You're sitting in my dad's office. I'm visiting my parents in Normandy. So you might see the background is a bit different from what you guys are used to. And there are, what could, cool could I show you first? Uh, on the other side, there is a, hold on. I'll show you something pretty cool. Hold on. There we go. I'm back. Hop. There we go. I, I should have prepared it. But this is a Mirage 3 stick. Uh, my dad ejected, as I told some of my followers before, um, 83, December 7, 83, and the French military gave him the stick. So that's uh, Mirage 3, he was flying, and <laughs> that lost his engine, so he had to eject. So that's what we have at the place. Anyway, uh, so I'm gonna start answering you guys' questions. And uh, yeah, so that you know, the Rafale stick is much smaller than this one. <laughs> um, Jing Zhang, salut, can you take us through your uh, DACT DACT? So uh, DACT are um, Rafale, as you say, against different fighters. And how did your Rafale fare against the Typhoon um, with their superior thrust to rate ratio? Very good question, uh, Jing. I never duck fighted a Typhoon. I, I, I got some Shot 2, a uh, Fox 2 on some RF Typhoons, but uh, not really duck fight. I actually got my section, air to air section leader exam in, uh, against Royal Air Force Typhoons. Um, but it wasn't, it was more a Fox 3 and not DACT. DACT is usually when you do a BFM or ACM, so close, um, close quarters. I never duck fighted Typhoons. Uh, I duck fighted F 18s. Alpha Jet, uh, F-16, stuff like that. 
um, the typhoon has a crazy thrust rate ratio, and what you but the AOA isn't crazy. Um, so the typhoon in terms of AOA isn't that good. So when you get into slow flying, you might get some opportunities. Um, it, it depends a lot of stuff. Basically, against the typhoon, I don't want to remain too high because because he has more powerful engines, he's going to be able to perform better at very high altitudes. So. Typhoons like to come in extremely high and fast, and we're going to try to bring them low um, because then we'll have less disadvantage. Um, so I hope it answers your, your question, Jing. Uh, it's all about understanding the weak points and your weak points to bring the fight where you want to fight, so low altitude. Uh, another thing, and I talked about it during an interview, is um, you want to create a lot of vertical separation with the typhoons because they know they have very big, very big sticks and they're very powerful. They tend to stay extremely high. So you want to try to fight them with a couple aircraft very high and trick them by sending a couple of your wingmans very low. And when I got my division leader um, exam, what we actually did was the typhoons were in the trails, so you could visually see them. Uh, so they were turning in the trails and. Uh, uh, I yeah I uh, went uh, low level talking 100 feet radar off everything off and then you just put your nose up and you see them visually <laughs> no link 60 involved nothing fancy just you get the pickup tally pickup uh, so where I want to get at is even when you're in a, an extremely powerful aircraft like the Typhoon you have to be very careful with your weak points and we all have some and you don't want to be overconfident because you're like hey I've got a better thrust to weight ratio than the opponent so always always be careful uh, about that. Uh, you can easily get tricked. And Rafale could be tricked by a MiG-21 or even an Alpha Jet. You really have to keep that in mind. Hope it answers your, your question, uh, Jin. Uh, the Freki Lepuni, do you think the Aeronaval would have been better off with the A4 Skyhawk or the A7 Corsair II than the Super E? French industrial loses not with stunning. Okay. Um, honestly, no. Honestly, no, because the Super E was used until very recently in combat and the A4 or the Corsair, no, but the Super E was a, a very stable platform that we were able to upgrade a lot. And, and I think it was a good platform. Um, not a crazy duck fighter, but I think it was a very reliable platform, something very safe, um, maybe tricky to land, especially at night, but something safe. And we kept adding add-ons and add-ons uh, on the Super E during its entire career. And, and honestly, I wouldn't have it replaced because it really did the job. I uh, wasn't here to do air superiority, but really did a good job of anti-surface and anti-ground. Um, and still today, it does have some capabilities that the Rafale hasn't picked up yet, especially around GBU-49. So uh, as a freaking know, I think the Super E was, a, was actually a pretty good choice. Um, do you find the lack of a helmet mounted sight a disadvantage? Yes. Um, Jing and all the other guys asking me about um, helmet mounted sight. The air to air part or BFM part of a mounted sight is maybe, I'd say, 50% of the use of a mounted sight. Nowadays in combat, sorry if you hear the plane, nowadays in combat it's like 20%. Uh, why? Because adding this type of helmet helps you for closer support as well. So it's not only for dogfighting, it can also find, be prove uh, useful on air to ground. Uh, so it, it is something we really want to use. We don't have it right now, but it's going to come. Um, I think the Indians are getting it. Um, John Hellis, any comment on the Rafale backseat ejection. Um, I honestly thought about doing a video on my channel about it, and I decided not to because I still know some guys in the service, and, and it's not very pleasant for the French Air Force. So let's say, uh, how does the American say? Like, I hide be behind the Fifth Amendment. I don't recall which one it is, but. Uh, I do not recall these, of, these, these, these events. Let's, let's say like that. No comment. Nothing to say. Um, do you ever fight the group in DACT? If so, how did the Rafale do um, SPQR77? Um, I did some man, um, some flights with the Gripen. The Gripen is a great jet, um, especially the new version with the active antenna. Uh, however, it lacks power. Um, 
Um, it really lacks power. It's a smaller aircraft, so it's tough to see. Uh, good weapons on board, um, but yeah, it's not as powerful. So with a Rafale against a Gripen, you want to bring him up. <laughs> the difference is bigger than between the Rafale and Typhoon. Um, but, but yeah, you really, it, it's not its not a crazy duck fire, long story short. The Frec Lepu, okay, I'll ask it how does the Rafale compare to the Typhoon? Uh, again, and I talked about it a lot, it, it really depends on rules of engagement, on the pilots, on, on the cuff, on what are you allowed to use, what situation, what are you doing, just air superiority, all that stuff. So it's extremely vague. Um, if you put a guy with 35 hours in the Rafale and a guy with 2,000 hours in the Typhoon, yeah, uh, and now you switch roles, you put a guy with 2,000 hours in the Rafale and 25 hours in the Typhoon, the result is going to be very different. So it really, really depends. And uh, nowadays, the tactical situation and what you do to lead toward the fight is extremely important. Uh, we like to say that 90% of the success of a mission is a preparation. Um, so honestly, like, you, you know, you could shoot down Typhoons or Rafale with Alpha Jets or Super Etendard if you, if you find a mistake or, or or stuff like that. So, so it's really tough to answer. Um, I won't be able to compare it like that. So it's just like comparing two sports car. Um, if you want to be more precise on the specific matters, then I can answer. But other than that, it's two different philosophies. The AOA limitation of the Typhoon is not very great, yet it's more powerful. So you have plus and cons everywhere. Um, Jing Zhang, do you notice any difference in rule rates, pitch rates in the combat configuration with a full... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any difference between air-to-air, -air, air to ground configurations? Yes. I won't tell you exactly. I'm not sure it's, I think it's open source, but uh, it's huge, just huge. Huge, as Trump says, huge. Um, so, so really, it's a, it's a different aircraft. When you're flying above Iraq with four bombs and missiles, and when you're flying in air shows, it's just, it's not the same aircraft. It doesn't feel the same at all. Um, yeah, the fifth, fifth amendment. Thank you. <laughs> I take the fifth. There you go. Uh, VL, Victor Lima. Ate, I have a question for you. Compare Rafale and F 16, please. Same as before. Uh, be more specific, guys, and I'll give you answers. If you stay like this, it's like a four hour subject. So, uh, I'll take the next question. If you have something specific you want me to compare, I'll do it, but be more specific. Uh, VAC, VL. Are there opportunities to become a test pilot or train as a country's Air Force pilot as opposed to becoming an airline pilot? Uh, yes, uh, plenty of opportunities. You could be flying for Dassault, you could be flying for Red Air, for aggressors, uh, like um, there are plenty of companies now in the US, in Canada, even in France, or uh, you could be employed by foreign militaries as well. Uh, so yes, there are a lot of different opportunities out there to to, to keep flying jets. Uh, however, I wanted to do, um, I, I wanted a good lifestyle to be able to start business and do other stuff. So it's all come down to what you want to do and it's personal choice, I guess. But yes, it is possible. I know personally several guys that left the service and still fly Rafale or uh, uh, tactical jets. Can you comment, um, Jing Zhang, can you comment on the I Alpha slow flight characteristics of the Rafale? Without breaking any secret, the Rafale minimum legal speed is 100 knots. And when you do the slow pass, guess what? 100 knots. Um, now, can the aircraft fly slower than 100 knots? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is it legal? No. <laughs> so you'll see it at 100 knots in air shows. And it's going to feel extremely slow because this 100 knots pass is with, head, with headwind. So let's say at 300 feet. You have 20 knots of wind, you're doing 100 knots, 20 knots of headwind, you're doing 80 knots of ground speed, which is pretty insane for, a, at the time, 13 tons aircraft, which looks good. Um, Carp Comet, did the direct voice input system work well? Um, you mean the stuff like in the movie with uh, Clint Eastwood? Like, uh, no, I, I never used uh, Carp Comet, I never used the voice system. Uh, wasn't in use when I was uh, active in active service. So I've never been able to talk to my machine. <laughs> Too bad. Um, but I think some guys do it in two seaters. They talk to the machine and there is a guy in the back that does stuff. But that's, that's I think it's called two seaters. <laughs> but no, single seat, never told to my machine. Sorry, Carp. 
um, the threat Lepuni. Will the Rafale be getting more powerful engines at any point? It is technically possible. It is an upgrade that is available right now that you could add easily 10 to 20% of thrust to the aircraft, uh, but not, I think it hasn't been budgeted, but it, it is something that uh, the M88 manufacturer, uh, Safran, the engine manufacturer is able to do pretty easily. Jinzan, can a Rafale use its primary infrared search tracking sensor as an initial autonomous passive way to identify and target a bandit? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, just makes sense. Um, just like any system on the Rafale, and what makes this aircraft so cool is everything talks to the system and everything comes in a screen, a center screen. So your infrared passive missiles, your infrared sensor on the front, your TV camera, your everything just as soon as it detects something, it's going to tell you. Uh, and to identify, yes, you're going to be able to use your camera stuff like that. So yes, um, yes, absolutely yes. So you don't need to have a radar on to detect the target. You can use also Link 16 or those passive stuff. So if you have a stealthy aircraft, um, let's say F-35, F-22, whatever, and the guy goes on burners or full power, are you going to be able to detect the infrared signature? Probably. I mean, infrared is infrared. So there are ways to try to mitigate it. But when you see the afterburners, it's tough to hide for sure. So those are stuff to take into consideration when you fight and for all the tactical stuff. So if some of you guys um, like to play on DCS, keep in mind you should be very careful with your throttle um, because just like you or um, your, your, your radar, um, send, I mean, it, it gives away your position to, to passive sensors, basically. Um, Grab Berzon, 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 sorry. Um, can the Rafale carry harm air, um, so anti-radiation missiles? If so, how many? And how do you practice with them during training? So um, officially, we do not do SID, suppression of enemy air defense. Uh, so we do not have any harm uh, missiles right now. We had some in the past on different aircraft. It was called the Martel. Uh, if you want to get into history a little bit, Charles Martel was the guy. We're talking middle age. Um, Marteau, uh, Marteau uh, um, was a guy that stopped the invasion of the. I'm not sure to say it without being disrespectful. Not trying to be disrespectful, but we call them the Muslims uh, back in. Uh, back in uh, the, the Middle Ages, so they were coming from the Mediterranean. They invaded the south of France. The Sarazan, not sure exactly how they were called, but the Muslims, they came all the way to Poitiers, which is in the middle of France. And Charles Martel stopped them. Big French victory, and then he took over the south of France. So uh, this guy, Charles Martel, he had a missile sort of named after him. It was a SID missile that we uh, don't use anymore. Uh, why I say sort of do it? Because now with some FSBUs, you could actually do some sort of SID, but officially we don't do it like the F-16, some F-16 do it. So we, the short answer is French technology thought that putting money and investment on uh, deception and on ECM jammers was better than on SID. And if you look at history, if you look at Vietnam, it sort of makes sense because honestly, can you see the French with the size of the French military? taking over a country like Vietnam with all the surface to a missile on the ground, just like you're going to run out of missiles at some point, and the U.S. had big issues with that. So if you want to play this seed against Sam War, be ready to have tons of missiles and aircraft available for seed. So we went the decoy and jammer route um, tactical choice. Actually, it's strategic choice. I hope it answered your, your question great. Cody. Knowing where the DARPA EAI and Western Tech is headed in 6G and Westshire, what would you tell young people who are thinking about combat aviation as a career? I would say aviation is great. I would say work to be able to get in that industry. So work on all the skills you need to work, but remain flexible because what we know in terms of aviation now is not going to be what they're going to be knowing 20, 30, or 40 years. Yet it's still flying. It's still freedom. It's still high tech. It's still 
a very exciting career. So, I mean, I've got I've got kids, and if they tell me I want to get into aviation, what I think, and that's my big joke currently. Look at the moon outside tonight. The moon is awesome those days. Is I honestly think our kids are are going to be able to go pretty routinely on the, on the moon. Uh, where I'm getting at is, yeah, target aviation, you might end up in space. Pretty cool. And maybe they'll be flying X-wings in a couple of years. I don't know. I just wish X-wings had guided missiles. I'll do a video about it because I don't understand how you can fly in space, go at light of speed, and you still have those laser dummy bomb, I mean, dummy lasers that aren't guided. But that, that's a, a different subject. So, yeah, I would tell those kids to work because to be able to have a good career in aviation like everywhere you have to pass some so some marks you have to get some degrees stuff like that so work as hard as you can get prepared and then there will be some pretty cool stuff waiting for them for sure um next question how fast have you flown in a rafale clean classifier <laughs> so, um it is marketed for map 1.8 classified stuff are you russian <laughs> um, okay, VL. At the in air to air combat mission, how can Rafael, Rafael, not Rafael, careful guys, have advantage against F 16? Is F 16 block 5052 version having an edge against Rafael? The F 16 is a great machine, but it won't be able to carry as much fuel, and the power is going to start missing after a couple of loops. What I mean is if you start high level, the F-16 is going to have to descend during the combat. And eventually, even if you have AMRAM stuff like that, you're going to have an advantage because you'll be able to regain attitude and have a better stake at some point. Uh, so F-16s are great. It's honestly an awesome aircraft, but it's it's a small aircraft that isn't able to carry that much fuel. And yet, a lot of different missions, a lot of different um, bombs and systems. So, so it's a very good aircraft, but yeah, it's it's as powerful, obviously. Do you think the movie, the, what do you think about the Chevrolet du Ciel as museum? I like it. I actually did some videos on my channel, one of, in French and English, where I talk about it. I'll be doing more. And I've been in contact with a producer, actually, uh, recently. Nice guy. Um, VL. Um, oh, uh, I don't, uh, Cody. Without crossing the line speak to how stealth tactics are evolving. Um, yeah, so how are stealth tactics evolving philosophy of air war? Honestly, um, they're not evolving that much Western tactics right now, um, but we're thinking about it and we're thinking, just ask yourself this question. Uh, I, I just did a series about missiles. It's in French right now, but I might do it in English if I, in, in a couple of weeks. When you shoot a Fox 3 missile, so Fox 3, when he goes pitbull, so he turns his small radar on, he has a small radar. And this small radar is in X-ray um, range as far as, um, as far as radar um, wavelength. The stealth currently for G20, F-35, F-22 are specifically designed to hide themselves from this X-ray band. So now, and I don't have the clue, so I can talk about it. Honestly, I never looked at, I never got into the secrets around that, so I don't know. Ask yourself, what are the odds of my Fox 3, even though maybe I detected the stealth aircraft thanks to the 16, I don't know what. I'm shooting my missile, but now my missile is getting toward, maybe in the good zone. Now he's opening his very small radar, but it's X-ray and maybe, maybe not. He sees the aircraft, maybe not. So what is it going to do for me as a pilot? Maybe, I say maybe because I, don't, again, don't have the answer. I would better fly, shoot a Fox 2. And that's where, honestly, MBDA and the French manufacturer and industry has been extremely smart, is that we have the Mika infrared, the Fox 2, that is basically able to be shot at the same range as a Fox 3. So we have Fox 3 with infrared sensors, just like some Russian with the AA-10 um, Charlie and Delta. Long story short, it is going to have an impact because you don't know the probability of kill of your Fox 3 against a stealth aircraft. So maybe you want to be 
willing to go more into the Fox 2 type of munition. So I don't have the answers around that. I think it's stuff that are being brainstormed currently in squadrons, uh, been out of the squadrons, but it is going to have an impact. On the other side, we have new missiles and the British too, like the Meteor, and those missiles are are game changers as well. But again, what is the likelihood of your missile getting pitbull and seeing the target? And I don't have the answer to that. But those are stuff I will keep in mind. I hope it's it made your day, um, Cody. <laughs> Vish, Vichy, Mirage 3 against Mirage 2000 against Rafale. Who wins in dogfight? I, I hope it's Rafale. When you see the price of the Rafale and the training of the pallet, <laughs> uh, which plane would you be afraid of in a Rafale? I'll be afraid of my tw of my twin in a Rafale. <laughs> uh, joke aside, uh, F-22. F-22. Yeah, F-22. Um, grape version how about rafale against f-16 regarding landing flaring before touchdown difficulty in crosswind any use of rudder i haven't flown f-16 honestly uh rafale and crosswind isn't much of an issue f-16 i don't know i have never heard of really issues regarding that um if you have issue with jets like that you put your hook down and you take your cable and, and you don't have issues anymore with Questrend. Um, John Wilco, hello Ate. How things, hello Ate. How things can you tell me? Do you know if typhoons are due to get an engine upgrade? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, are typhoons going to get a 20% upgrade? I don't know. Like the Rafale, they could upgrade the engines. That's what I know for sure. Uh, but you have to pay and right now honestly is there isn't really the need but let's say world wall five breaks out maybe we'll get the better engines for the typhoon i honestly don't know jinzen is there a difference in training philosophy and method between the u.s navy and the french Aero naval yes huge <laughs> uh huge why because the so u.s military it's like the empire in star wars um it's huge it's huge, you have to produce numbers, you have to have uh, extremely standardized militaries. You don't have a choice. You run a new, you have to manage huge numbers of pilots and everything. Uh, French military were just a couple of guys. Um, so it's like Amazon against you to, the, your shop, your small business down the road. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, you, you, you see my point. So in terms of training and philosophy, it's the same. Uh, initially with the Navy, US Navy, you're gonna have to 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 pass the standards. Uh, with the French military, we, we do have standards, but we don't really care about them because because we're not as much, we need to be sure that you give all you, that you really are all you can be. So even if you're here, you're here, great. I don't care about the standard being here. You're here, I want, I'm going to test you here and I'm going to put, I'm going to decide that for you today, your standards are here and oh, you're bad. You have to push yourself better. So the philosophy, the training philosophy is a, is a bit different. You really have to be giving 120% every single day because we want to make sure you're all you can be. And in the US military, it does happen for sure, but later down the road, uh, and the reason is because they have numbers and they can be as like, tailored in terms of training. So it's like, a little different. Um, both work very well. Uh, I've been training both. Um, makes sense on both sides. Uh, and there is a reason why our military train or, or, or pilots that way. Uh, it's really adapted to, to the workforce. Okay. Um, Zangville, how realistic, accurate are modern PC flight sims? If you spend hundreds of hours in DCS world, would there be any amount of crossovers to the real thing? Yes, um, I actually posted videos about it. Uh, I, I think it's 80 to 85% what the real thing is like. And to prove it, just look at the fact that the French military now use Mirage 2000 in DCS for basic training. And the A-10s, I think, in the US Air Force have been using DCS for uh, a while now. Um, so crossovers, yes, then it's not the real thing for sure. Uh, there's a huge difference between the two, but uh, I, I think it's very good stuff. And I didn't start a, a channel called Aviation Esports for no reason. I really think it's, there are a lot of 
similarities. It's not exactly the same, especially for the aspect the way you can see the other aircraft. I find it easier in real life, but I'm more used to it. But no, I think it's pretty cool. Jack Maxwell, how big of an advantage does the new Meteor give the Rafale compared to other Fox 3? Uh, it's huge. It, 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 I mean, it does make a difference, really, in terms of numbers and, and distances. Um, but those Meteors are great with active antennas. You need active antennas. Itco Velociped. Was there a time when a supposedly inferior aircraft surprised you in a DAT? Uh, honestly, no, because I never underestimate an inferior aircraft. So I never merge thinking that the other aircraft is inferior. Uh, why? Because every, even an inferior aircraft has an area where it's better than your aircraft. Look at the Alpha Jet. The Alpha Jet can do barrel rolls at 80 knots. I can do barrel rolls at 80 knots with a Rafale. So if you put yourself in a situation where it's gonna, you're going to be extremely slow, you might be at 100 knots like this, and it's go, whoo-hoo, barrel roll 80 knots, Fox 2, bye-bye, I think. So um, if you merge with a bind mindset, then you might be surprised by an inferior aircraft. If you don't merge with a bad mindset, then you, you shoot them down. <laughs> um, Charles Martel, the hammer of Paris. <laughs> yes. Um, Dvun Vital, how good is a Russian Sukhoi 30 compared to the Rafale? I, I think it's, again, depends on what you want to do. Uh, lots of fuel, very powerful, lots of low wing load. You can pull off stuff below the aircraft. You can have a good, decent playtime. But uh, if you want to do slow BFM, it's not going to be very useful. It really depends on what you want to do with it. Uh, I think the Rafale is better, but it depends on what you want to do with it. Uh, Jing Zhang, do you get a lot of adversio in the Rafale in the event of complete loss of... No, no. Uh, if you lose an, air, an engine in the Rafale, just look at the ways the, the engines are separated. If you look at the Sukhoi, they're like that. If you look at the Rafale, they're like that. So if you lose an engine, yaw is not much of an issue. What is your favorite aviation movie? Mm. The Final Countdown is awesome. Top Gun is awesome. Behind Enemy Lines is awesome. <laughs> I love them all. Um, Jingzhan, where uh, is your favorite place to fly in France and in continental Europe? I like Greece. Greece is nice. Um, Spain is nice as well. Yeah, I mean, everywhere. As long as we have good airspace. No, uh, I'll, I'm a pretty easygoing guy. So, no, anywhere. <laughs> um, Mo oh, guys. Sorry to butcher your call signs, but sometimes they're hard to pronounce. Mukituja. DCS have models with advanced flight models. Look for these. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, Star Wars is specific war in space, indeed. Uh, Spar 77, for its time, do you think the F1 was a superb multiple jet? Easy to answer. You know the market of the century? F-16 against F-1? F-16-1. So, yeah, I think the F1 was cool, but apparently F-16 was better, and F-16 still is pretty cool. So I guess it was slightly below the F-16. Um, Lock who? Hi, Ate. We enjoyed your interview. What do you think of the F-35? I'll be making a video about it. Um, don't expect any French passion from me. I actually visited um, the F-35 RAG uh, before COVID-19. I was invited down south in Tucson, Arizona. So to keep it short, expect in the coming month a video about it. And my two cents is that we're judging, we're currently judging the F-35 as if he was an adult, yet he's 12 years old. I mean, it's like, he's, not, he's barely a teenager yet, and we're judging. Oh, I think just had a just had a small issue with Skype. It's better. Um, Luke Ufu is stealth overrated. Again, depends. Um, 
so it can be overrated if you want to conduct very discrete missions there to ground. Is it overrated against an opponent that that isn't prepared? Uh, I think it's good to have. It's it's just good to have. It's like, hey, is hybrid engines overrated for cars? Uh, I'd rather have two different engines than one. I mean, you, you see what I mean? So I, I don't like to go into the overrated part. Just understand that it's just one piece. And if you go full burner, your stealth is useless uh, against higher seekers. Mario Bros Gamers Warsome. My mom told me not to jump on my bed, but she jumps on her bed at 2 a.m. Not for indeed. Yes, Mario, you're f <laughs> uh, Cody. Without giving away too much, how is Sixji looking at dealing with modern AI ideas? Merci. Uh, I'll, have, I'll have to look more into, into that. I don't want to, I mean, you look like an educated guy. Uh, I'll have to get deeper. I'll take the fifth on this one. I have to check my open sources. <laughs> Uh, Jing Zhang, can you take us through the challenges of a low-level high-speed anti-ship mission in the Super Atlanta and Rafale? Uh, challenges are uh, the enemy fleet moves. Um, maybe you're going to get the position of the enemy fleet three hours before your strike time. So you're going to start planning against the fleet where you know the position three hours from deli weapons delivery time. And they can do 30 knots in any direction. So now you're playing an entire mission, fuel everything against a target that might be moving 90 miles north, east, south, west. So you now have 180 miles difference possible between two possibilities. What I mean by that is 180 miles difference is going there and coming back, 400 miles. 400 miles is insane for a low level attack. So the big difficulty is dealing with an ever changing environment because if you have a fleet, Let's say that's your all value target. And you say, hey, the two other ships are south, like this. So we're going to be attacking from the north. But guess what? Now, for the time it took you to take off and everything, now you have an upgrade. Hey, the position is 30 miles from the expected position, but you're coming from the north. Now the other air boats are north. Your target is now south. So what do I do? Do I have to turn around to attack on a different axis? Should I still attack? Should I attack one of the other boats? What should I do? And all those stuff are what we call the what ifs, tactical what ifs. It's in my book. If you enjoy books, da -da -da, self promotion, debrief, best selling book on Amazon. <laughs> uh, but jokes aside, um, you have to deal with it and you have to anticipate all those stuff. And when you do air to ground stuff like that, it's not the same. The building isn't going to move. Uh, so the real difficulty is planning in advance because you won't be able to um, you won't be able to talk to your crew. Why? Because you want to mitigate the radio ECM um, uh, communication all that stuff. So you don't want to speak on the frequency, otherwise it's going to give away the position of your of your aircraft. So everything has to be anticipated, and it's a lot of work. That's why anti ship is a very specific mission, and we used to do it. Zip flip, nobody talks at night, four to six aircraft. Sometimes we're uh, with air superiority uh, airborne as well. So it, it is one of the biggest challenges. Right. Okay, Ate, um, uh, like this has been a great Q&A, but like, if you can pick maybe one more question and then we're going to wrap up this, but it's been absolutely brilliant. And I, before I go, I want to say thank you very much to Cody uh, for donating there. Thank you very much. And oh, yeah, and for the British around you, uh, for the British around, I, I talked about my dad, uh, stick and everything, but his last assignment in the French military was Royal Air Force Linton and News. So he was, he actually trained, and I think you had one of them, uh, yeah. he trained 80 around the 90s, uh, some of the first female pilots in the, in the, in the British military. And uh, that's picture, hold on, all picture, Jet Provost, but uh, those oh, are yeah, the JP, yeah, wow. Guys, Royal Air Force guys, and oh, just let me up show you. That's picture of a French pilot in the British Royal Air Force jet. Oh, wow, oh. that's amazing, that's it. 
<laughs> and actually, you can tell there is British sense of humor because they, of course, they gave him the gift and they gave him the the model of the jet provost, and they put number sixty nine on it as it was French. So, <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah. So if you you can answer like uh, yeah, let's uh, one more question there at it, and then I'll let you go because I know you're a busy man at the moment, so I'll, yeah. I'll let you loose. I have an interview with a Toronto radio in in fifteen minutes. Yes, um, yeah, so yes. One uh, that I've interviewed before. Uh, yeah, uh, Dan Kenstein. I have an and Sam Um g- Given your perspective and experience as a fast mover pilot, thoughts on traditional conventional wings lo- layouts versus Delta. Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I think the Delta is is a philosophy, uh, and it's good to fly fast, um, enables you to carry a lot of fuel. Uh, I think the Delta is great, yet it comes to a price, and that price is understanding that above a given AOA, you're going to kill yourself <laughs> if you're not careful. <laughs> uh, but, but, but once you get to understand that, I think it's it, it's awesome. Delta is very cool. Um, but again, I, I'm used to Delta. Uh, I was flying Super E before. I think Delta, I, I think that's an important point. Um, I, I know some of you guys saw me flying against um, Groning Sidewinder, or if you look at my, my YouTube um, video games channels. With the Delta, you're really going to be able to sort of really stop yourself. Yeah. And that's going to enable you in the Fox 2 or Fox 3 world to get the first shot opportunity. And that's key because Basically, you're merging with the guys, you're like sitting yourself on the engine, ah, really turning, Fox 2, flare, flare, put your nose down, your missile is flying. The other guy is going to be like, oh, I have to defeat. <laughs> and then you either go in six o'clock if you defeat it, or uh, splash one right away. So I think that's a, that's a good thing about Delta. Uh, yet, if you watch my first movie um, videos, you're going to see that Delta, if you don't put enough power, if you don't anticipate, you're gonna launch short. You're gonna you're gonna fly like this in, on the ground. So it, it can be careful. So I think it, it's just it, it's like everything. It, it requires specific training and adaptation, but it is a role of the pilot to adapt to the machine that is given to him. Um, yeah. I'm never gonna complain about the max max have issue. I, I I won't be the one complaining. I'll adapt. Uh, it's your job to adapt. And why do you have to keep this philosophy? Because when you get hit by a missile, when you have a a faulty aircraft when you have an issue you can't just say aircraft falls i'm out guys yeah, that's no, okay, I mean, yeah. actually you could with the ejection seat but the taxpayer is not going to like it and as an airline pilot i can't pitch that anymore so, uh, exactly so yeah yeah you have to adapt and deal with it and um and it's our goal to yeah to understand our weaknesses and and make the most of it so yeah well, what a brilliant Q and A later at it. But uh, before we go, like, let us know what, what, where can we find you online, and like, what what do our viewers search for? Um, so I've got a channel called uh, Atishwe. Um, uh, uh, actually, in the chat, I'll say hello. But that's uh, that, that's my main channel. Uh, otherwise, I've got a new channel that is called Aviation Esport, uh, where I'm going to be posting more uh, flight simulation content and and be doing some esports stuff. Otherwise, I've got a website, it's combatproven.org, and I've got a book called uh, Debrief so that adapts aviation methodology to your everyday life because the big message is that you're all in charge of your old single-seat aircraft yourself uh, every is day. Is that available on Amazon? It's on Amazon, yes. It's yeah. uh, self-edited on Amazon because, uh, you know, single-seat guys, I like to. <laughs> <laughs> control. Actually, Amazon self-edition is great. Yeah. So it's on Amazon self-editing, but if you want like a a written stuff you can email me and we'll figure it out but uh but it's, it's on amazon and uh, and yeah it's uh that's pretty much it or you google myself you google at issue on youtube and or on on google and you'll find plenty of stuff <laughs> yeah well, you didn't... if you like linkedin i'm on linkedin too <laughs> awesome at well obviously you're doing amazing at the moment you got the book out there uh, you got your channel and uh, obviously your uh, commercial side of things. and But hopefully we can get you back on the channel because there's so many questions coming in that I've seen we couldn't even answer. But uh, if we can get you back on the channel, that would be absolutely incredible. It would be with pleasure. I was ask who the bikini girl is in the back. It's just... Uh, <laughs> Ooh. Silver, silver wings established. That's Pin-up girl, uh, yeah. 
question about kids earlier. So if you want your kids to get into aviation, buy them stuff like That's that. That's the one, yeah. <laughs> it's gonna keep you motivated, and if it's a girl, buy, buy the same stuff with a boy. Or <laughs> I make my merch with my face on it, and like, oh look. <laughs> Well, Ate, what a wonderful Q and A this was! Like you, you, you're an absolute gem, and uh, you like you've answered some uh, uh, great questions. So thank you very much. And I know you've got like ten minutes to go before your big interview. Where, where, where are you going? Is it a Canadian uh, uh, website or uh... Canadian radio? It's a French biggest French radio in. Oh, hold on. Up oh, there, we go. biggest French radio in uh, Toronto. So a big wow. French broadcaster in Toronto. So I, I, I was featured in a Good Day Dakota last week. Wow. <laughs> so some press uh, in North America currently. So pretty fun. That's awesome. And I'm well-deserved, of course, like well, definitely well-deserved because you're like, you, you bring like aviation to, you know, like uh, us guys who love aviation and stuff like that. So well-deserved, mate. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can get you back on the channel maybe in like a, a month or so and uh, answer more, some, uh, some more questions. But uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Thanks. Cheers, mate.